So th thanks a lot. So we are now uh, in the first panel. Uh, my name is Ottmar Edenhofer. I'm the director of the Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact Research and I'm also uh, chair of climate economics at the uh, Technical University in Berlin. Now, uh, the, the purpose of, of this panel is we want to provide you with some metrics uh, about climate change and also about the loss of biodiversity. And climate economics has tried to translate the climate damages into a matrix which is called the social costs of carbon. So you might think the social costs of carbon is a typical academic idea, but still the social costs of carbon has legal implications, at least in the United States. So the social costs of carbon are the metric which all the regulations uh, are measured against, and this is a quite important aspect. We have not such a legal implication in, in Europe, but nevertheless this plays a quite important role uh, when climate policy should be evaluated, but also uh, it could be used to evaluate investment. So this is the purpose of the whole, um, of the whole panel uh, for the next 75 minutes. I would like to introduce uh, the panelists in the order of their presentation. We start with an 8 to 10 minute presentation, a statement, each of the panelists, and then we try to facilitate a reasonable discussion among us, and then we open the floor for questions. Now let me, let me start with the panelists. The first one is Leonie Wenz. She is from the Potsdam Institute. She is there, uh, the working group leader, uh, and she is uh, carrying out all this analysis around climate damages and the social costs of carbon. So she is a, a brilliant young scientist. She received uh, already a few uh, offers from prestigious universities, especially on, on this issue. So after Leonie, I would like to ask then Katrin uh, Böning-Gese to talk about biodiversity losses. Sorry for that. So <laughs> I, I, I know so um, it, it was the, your shining light, which basically... Um, um, so Katrin Böning-Gese, she's a, a very important uh, figure in, in, in the German science system. Professor at the Goethe University uh, holds many prestigious prizes and she is, so to say, the most important person on biodiversity and she tries to link biodiversity with, with climate. So after that, um, I would like then to ask Sabine Maudra. She is the member of the executive board in the Deutsche Bank. Bundes um, uh, oh. <laughs> Deutsche, Deutsche Bundesbank. So. <laughs> <laughs> again, again, uh, in the flight was uh, the, the head of the Deutsche Bank, so ah, I was okay, a little okay. bit confused. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the, the executive board of the Deutsche Bundesbank, and um, uh, in, in, in her capacity, she is uh, uh, dealing with uh, financial market stability, but also with the greening of the financial system. So this is where we had many interactions over the last few years. And then she will respond, uh, so how uh, uh, the, the, the Bundesbank and also central banks could include this kind of metrics. And then uh, at the very end, uh, I would like to hand over uh, to Simone Rus-Vergote from MSCI. She is a global head on climate policy and uh, I hope that you can explain us, so to say, how the financial market, the capital markets, the private sector might take into account this, uh, uh, this, this, this measurements and this, this metrics. And I think uh, this is great that we have such a wonderful panel and we try to bridge, so to say, uh, uh, the climate science, economics, biodiversity, financial markets and central banks. So mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's something which, which, which is our, at least our ambition. So with, without uh, any further delay, I would like to hand over to Leonie to start mm -hmm. with the presentation about eight to ten minutes and then uh, we go around uh, as I have announced. So please. Yes. <coughs> so thanks a lot for, for the introductory remarks. Um, thanks for inviting me. So as Otmar said, um, a lot of my work actually deals with how to measure climate impacts and risks, and I would like to give you some overview and insights into that kind of research. And let us start with a very simple observation that several of the previous speakers have already made too. So climate change is not a distant threat. Climate change is already there and is affecting us um, today. Just um, 
a couple of recent examples um, of extreme weather events that have occurred um, throughout the world and that has been, have been made more intense and more frequent because of climate change. Um, just to add another example, there's a ma major heat wave in Europe um, coming up next week. And such extreme weather events have um, multiple effects on our life. They, they can cause multiple damages. Um, just one recent example, the, the massive heat wave in India and Pakistan, also already mentioned today, with temperatures reaching up to 50 degrees Celsius. There have been um, a great number of um, people that were killed because of the heat wave. There have been many hospitalizations. There have been kids that couldn't go to school. There have been workers who, who couldn't work or worked less productively. And this all has been made worse by, by limited access to cooling because of the ongoing fuel shortage. There's also been a major impact on agriculture. Um, wheat crop yields have been reduced, in, particularly in India, which will have major implications for global food security, which is already threatened because of the ongoing war in the Ukraine. So just a few impact channels, but this gives you already a little bit of an idea of the local and global impacts of such an event and also the, the, the more short term and the more longer term implications. So measuring these impacts is a challenge. This is just one event and it has occurred in the past. So the question is, and maybe we don't really have to ask this here because we have heard this already a couple of times, but why do we care? Why is it so important to, to gain a robust understanding of these, these impacts? And uh, as you mentioned earlier, there's a demand of the market for um, such assessments for investment decisions, for example. But of course, um, such assessments are also important for adaptation and mitigation decisions. Currently, there's a lot of focus on the cost of energy transitions, of um, climate change mitigation, but what is much less well known is that the alternative of not doing enough about climate change is going to be much more costly, which is uh, sketched in this pie chart recently published in a major German newspaper article. So measuring the, climate ch the impacts of climate change is important but challenging. And one key concept, one key tool or figure to do so are the social cost of carbon that Ottmar Edenhofer mentioned already. So basically the social cost of carbon is a number, typically in US dollars, that tells us how much the emission of one additional ton of CO2 will cost us. So it's basically a huge accounting exercise to quantify all the climate impacts across time and space and to convert them into a common unit, US dollars, um, through valuation and discounting. As Otmar said, it's the social costs of carbon are being heavily used um, for investment decisions, in particular in the US, but have also a big influence on climate policy in the rest of the world. And one key tool, I mean, the, the key question still is how do we get this number? And what has previously been done is that this number has been computed with so-called um, cost-benefit integrated assessment models. Those are complex, big models. One of the most well-known ones is the DICE model by Nobel laureate Bill Nordhaus. They basically have a climate module and an eco economics module and depict the interlinkages. And at their core is a damage function. And the damage function basically translates changes in temperature into economic damages. So the damage function is really key here, but of course uh, has several limitations. In particular, the damage functions that have been used in the past to come up with an estimate of the social cost of carbon have been criticized, to put it uh, mildly, because they are rather outdated. So basically, what has happened in the, over the past 10 or 15 years is that we have seen kind of like an explosion of empirical studies a rapidly growing body of empirical literature that demonstrates that climate change affects almost every sector in ev almost every region around the world and that the aggregate costs are likely much higher than is the what is being assumed here by um, the integrated assessment models. Just to give you an idea, so uh, 
temperature target of three degrees Celsius or four degrees Celsius, which would be massive climate change, like the end of the world as we know it, would have like basically just really small blue is the dice model impacts on global GDP around a 4% um, loss. So what needs to be done now, and the social cost of carbon is currently being revised in the US, um, Biden has um, asked for such, such a revision. So what needs to be done is that this recent empirical evidence is integrated or considered when assessing the social cost of carbon. And with my colleagues at PIC, we have contributed to this kind of literature in several ways. Here are three recent studies. In the first one, we have, first one, sorry. We have shown that if we look at temperature impacts at a subnational scale, and not a national or regional scale, but subnational, for more than 1,500 regions worldwide, the impacts of rising temperatures on economic output are much larger than what was previously thought. In the second study, we have considered a new impact channel, and that is not just temperatures that are going up, but also temperature variability changing, and have shown that this exerts a strong additional pressure. And in the last study published a couple of um, months ago as cover story Nature, we have illuminated different um, impact channels of rainfall changes. <coughs> so this is like first work in an attempt to gain a more comprehensive, a more robust understanding of the social cost of carbon. These are projections based on the first paper where we use the empirically observed relationship between temperature and the economy to project losses under future warming. And the global average would be 14% income loss compared to the 4% income loss from, from the previous assessments. But you can see that regionally, in particular in the tropics, income losses by the end of the century could even be much higher. The implied social cost of carbon or carbon price of those damages would be around $140 today and then strongly going up till the end of the century. And, that's, and this is really important here, that's just damages from temperature changes. So um, many other important aspects of climate change, such as sea level rise or um, tropical storms, um, are not um, included in that kind of assessment. Nevertheless, our projections are <coughs> already used, for example, by the Network for Greening the Financial System or by the US Council of Economic Advisors for Macroeconomic Forecasts, which again shows that there's a clear need for, um, for such assessments. A couple of other things that are not included in, in our assessment that are promising avenues for further research and that we could pro possibly discuss um, now are um, the metric, so we used um, changes in economic output as a measure for economic well-being. Of course, well-being is more than just that. So there are health impacts, there are impacts on biodiversity, um, on conflict. Then there are risk and inequality considerations. So the same damage can affect different people in different places quite differently. There's the open question of the role of adaptation and also of how persistently these damages can affect us. And with that, I would like um, to conclude for now and hand on to the next speaker. Okay, thanks Thank a lot. <laughs> now, um, this is only climate change, and these are only more or less the, the market-based uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, damages. But there is much more at stake. Uh, it's in particular biodiversity and, and also the link between biodiversity and climate change needs in a particular uh, thorough uh, discussion. And I would like to ask you, Katrin, to do this now. Yeah, thank you very much. So what I'm going to talk about is the role of biodiversity in ecosystems. Um, for, for humanity and for the planet, but also how this can be captured in reporting for companies and eventually investors. And with biodiversity, we are struggling with quite uh, some more degrees of complexity than in the climate system. But nevertheless, there are ways forward how to capture this, not as nicely, 
as with social costs of carbon or social costs of lost species, but with a perhaps more descriptive approach, but also we do have um, strong measures of the different components of biodiversity. So what is biodiversity? The definition it is, is that it's the diversity of the various components of life on Earth, diversity of species, diversity within species, and diversity of landscapes. And for practical purposes, we are almost exclusively studying diversity of species. There we have the most data. And what we biodiversity researchers do measure is here indicated in this scale. On the left hand side, on the top, you see, for example, the Living Planet Index, very important index that is measuring the abundances of species. It's mostly vertebrates, mostly mammals, mostly birds. They show here at the global scale, that's the way we do our reporting, a decline over more than 30% in the last 30 years. Our second important indicator is the red list index that measures the proportion of species that is threatened by extinction. Here depicted for a couple of species groups with declines. A third measure, and that is already fairly simple because we are running here out of data, is how do we measure changes in plants? And what we often measure is just the extent of ecosystems, like here the forest extent, without looking too much into detail, but at least this is a measure that we can easily measure at the global scale. And many of the other measures are derived from this measure. Some of the measures, like here you see at the bottom right hand side, the percent of live corals is a measure of the condition of ecosystems, where we see that in many eco at, um, coral ecosystems we have a decline of living corals and this is a decline of um, the condition of ecosystems. Now to look in a little bit more detail, a very important indicator is uh, the our threatened species. That's calculated by IUCN, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, with, with these red list categories, starting with critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable. And we have a reasonable accounting for the better known organism group on Earth, which species are threatened by extinction, starting with groups with little threat value, like um, bony fishes, also the birds are doing very well, and other groups like amphibians or cycads, that's a specific group of ferns, um, very old group, uh, where we have 30 or even 60% of the species threatened by extinction. A second indicator is basically the aerial extent of different parts of the ecosystem, natural ecosystems, and what is here most significant is protected area. And here, just a figure of the most important protected areas we have on Earth, that's again delineated by the IUCN, the protected areas categories one and two, really strictly protected areas, and key bi biodiversity areas that are often not yet protected, but are bottom up determined as the most important areas on Earth for biodiversity protection. Also, we have World Heritage Sites. Now, one important issue, and that makes the biodiversity debate more complicated than the climate debate is that one unit species is not the same across the Earth. We have spatial patterns and we have hotspots of species diversity. And for example, for birds, we know species richness is highest in the tropics, especially in tropical mountain regions like the Andes, East African Rift Valley or the southern slopes of the Himalaya. And in these areas, we also in general, but not always, find also rare species and threatened species. So basically a unit destroyed by diversity in Germany would have a different impact on biodiversity overall than a unit destroyed land, for example, in the Andean um, um, forests. One more step further, biodiversity does not only have a value by itself, it has also a value for people and that's measured through ecosystem services. And we distinguish three types of ecosystem services. Regulating services, for example, pollinator diversity or the presence of forests that protect assets. 
We have material ecosystem services like fish stocks, but also forest extent if a company relies on a forest. And we have non-material ecosystem services, for example, supporting identities that's often collected, uh, connected to, to land use. And the International uh, Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystems has assessed these different ecosystem services with declines in most of 18 different types, which is basically then also very important for companies. And that's where I'm switching gears. That was the nat natural science side of the issue. How might this matter now for the reporting, the ISSB standards or the EFRAG standards that are now discussed? And how can this be um, basically put in financial and sustainability reporting? Now for the ecosystem services, we basically can turn the argument around. We can now ask companies, how do they see their risks and opportunities by identifying the ecosystem services a company depends on? So this might be regulating ecosystem services. For example, the dependency on pollinator diversity or the dependency on forests that protect um, the assets of a company from hazard. For example, mangrove forests at a coastal company, um, company building or in a river valley where we have a protective forest upstream. Second issue, material ecosystem services. Does a company depend on forested areas or on the abundance of uh, fish stocks? And non-material ecosystem services, the people that work for the company, their identities depend also on the stability of land cover. So such changes can also disrupt identities. And if you now see what is happening in the Artal, how much people are influenced by this flood um, it, it really changes the whole region and the population that is living there. Second aspect, now we are looking at the impact of companies on biodiversity and ecosystems. What we can look at is the impact on the abundance of species, especially threatened species. And as indicates, thus we have here these IUCN red lists of species, but also basically in each jurisdiction national red lists that you need to look out for in Germany. It would be, for example, the red kite, and especially vulnerable species. We need to look at the impact on natural areas, and here we can look at the extent, for example, of a forest, the condition of a forest, how natural this forest is, and the significance of this forest. Are there threatened species? Is this a, spe a specifically important species? And here, if you are dealing with indigenous communities, for example, in Bolivia, this forest might have a sacred um, importance, so the significance of this forest might be basically irreplaceable. And here, as an indicator, we can use the US IUCN lists on protected areas and the maps on key biodiversity areas. And such an area in Germany would be the Bayerischer Wald, the first um, national park we had in Germany. And thirdly, we need to look at the impact of a company on ecosystem services, regulating and non-material ecosystem services should not be forgotten, for example, if there's an impact on forested watersheds. As data, we can use primary data collected by the company, for example, data on species, which is probably only practical if um, the area impacted by a company is small and can be assessed um, really on the ground. We can rely on secondary data, for example, maps of protected area, and we can use model data, for example, the global dose response relationship for land use, where we uh, translate land use change in changes in biodiversity value. And I think I need, I am skipping the offits and just want to finish. Biodiversity and ecosystems is a more complicated issue than climate, but nevertheless, we now have measures which obviously need to improve constantly also in the future with which we can assess both the risks and opportunities and the impact of companies on biodiversity and ecosystems. Thank you very much for your attention.
Yeah, Katrin, uh, thanks a lot. This, this was really fascinating and I would like to share one experience. So at the global scale, we have two very important international institutions. The one is the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and the other one is IPBES uh, on biodiversity. And over the last 30 years, I would say, um, IPCC was in the public and also in influencing the decision makers much more successful because they had a very simple metric, either the social costs of carbon mm -hmm. or let's see at least a temperature target, so to say. And what you have presented is now uh, that regarding biodiversity, the whole thing is uh, much more complicated and it is hopeless uh, to expect that we can reduce the biodiversity issue to one single number and to one single metric. And I think this is a, a huge challenge and, and, and uh, it's, it's all about to say, do, do we, are we precisely wrong or roughly right, right? And, and if we would like to focus just on the social costs of carbon and nothing else, we would be precisely right. And, and I think we have to come up with a, a much broader set of, of metrics and this is still a, a challenge to incorporate this then in, in, in all the, the reportings for companies, the capital markets, but also um, at, at, at the national scale. So there is no accounting on the GDP which takes into account this different metric. So with that, I would like to, to, to hand over to, to Sabine. Uh, so you are very much involved in, in, in all this uh, uh, kind of, of, of uh, 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 greening, so to say, the Bundesbank and, and the, the word of the central banks taking into account the financial risks. And uh, so I would quite keen to learn about your thoughts on these issues. And in particular, I hope you have a few very good ideas to incorporate this complex biodiversity metric. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> so first of all, thank you, Ottmar, and uh, thank you, Leonie and Katrin. Very insightful and useful also for my, uh, for my uh, capacity or my function. Maybe before I start, um, some of you m might ask, you know, what, what does a central banker hear on this panel, right? And uh, I must admit, when um, Mr. Kran called me and asked me whether I would like to join this panel, I was a little bit stubborn because I think I'm not a standard setter, I'm not a scientist, so, but it definitely makes sense to be here and I'm very thankful um, that you convinced me to come over here. So maybe um, for all of you or who just wonder, you know, what has a lady from a central bank to do here? Um, central banks are, or the mandate of central banks um, is affected by climate change and we now also find out by biodiversity, right? Um, let me start with, um, so our core mandate is price stability, as you know. And um, prices will be and are affected by climate change and most probably also by, by loss of biodiversity, but we are not capable of, you know, um, uh, calculate that so far. But what we so far already can tell is that prices are affected uh, by climate change. Very simple example, as you uh, mentioned, we see droughts, we see also floods, but especially droughts, which have quite an impact on food prices already. Um, less here in our region, but globally a significant impact. Think of Brazil, of Madagascar, um, we also see now um, the problems that uh, north of Italy has, uh, so it is coming closer, right? And also the energy prices uh, will be affected significantly by climate policy and either with certain or, or adequate climate policy or even worse, if those climate policies are missing, right? <laughs> so it is within, you know, our core mandate but where we started, to be honest, is um, to look at the effect of climate change on the financial stability. So what does that mean? So what we thought is, uh, or had a close look at, at is, you know, how is the whole financial stability system affected by everything we see that's related to climate change? And so basically we found out that we have two kinds of risks because we always come from the financial risk, right? Because we are dealing with finance, with numbers, right? And we sorted out that we have two significant um, financial risks. This is the physical risk, you know, all this goes in line with droughts, floods, hurricanes, 
and all other um, weather events. The second one is transitional risk. So this risk that occurs if, uh, if the policy makers do not do their job or do too little too late or, what's, or do nothing, right? So what will this have, what kind of impact financially will this have on the real economy, especially on the real economy, but also on the financial sector? So those two risks we had a look at. And to get it, you know, the, the topic today is, you know, how do we measure the effect on climate or loss of biodiversity? And so what we did, we are not a standard setting, but at, but we also have to put numbers on something, have to calculate it. So what we do, what we did uh, together with PIG was we set up different scenarios. So we did a scenario analysis because what we have to do is, and the, what we usually do as Andrew Bank is we look backward. You know, what kind of experience did we have in the past? But for now, for climate change, this will not help us, right? Because we have no, no figures, no experience that we really can, um, that can be afloat. So what we did was um, we set up different scenarios. So let me just uh, three categories mentions. Um, unfortunately, time is limited, so let me focus just on those threes. So we set up an orderly transition, meaning in an ideal world, political decision makers would wake up today and say, oh my God, we really have to make decent decisions, right? So then, you know, the economic impact would be, you know, I would say capable. Still, there is an impact if you have a global earthy warming uh, de degree of 1.6 uh, 1 or 1.7, but we know it's capable. The most, the more, pr you know, probable uh, scenarios we had a look at was disorderly transition or hot house world. So let me uh, tell you what we think about or th uh, what we, uh, when we talk about disorderly transition, that means, you know, at some point, political decision makers realize we have to deal uh, or to act. We set up policies in place, but way too late. So we calculated that. And for now, the figures we do have, but we have to redo it. But uh, the last one we had from you know, one and a half years ago was we might end up with a global war, depending on what, but we might even in that scenario manage below two degrees. But then, you know, disorderly would mean even not too late. But unfortunately, what we are living right now is the current policies, or even if you take into account those, uh, those commitments from, from um, global commitments, um, it still looks like a hot house world with scenarios, and I don't have to tell you, like right up, um, up to four degrees or 3.6 degrees or whatsoever. So, why do we care about global earth warming as, as economists or as central bankers? Because they have a significant economic impact, you know? What we see is a, a significant impact on GDP, on productivity, productivity on um, prices, on employment rates, on and so on. I could continue forever. And so what you know, what is the goal? Of course, we have to estimate the impact of those risks, right, with those different scenarios. But I think what my hope is also, because central banks have credibility, you know, when it comes to numbers and, and analytic capacities. So what my, you know, intention is also not just to calculate for myself and for, you know, can tell you that's a financial stability issue, but also to make, you know, really political decision makers aware of what really, besides of all those human tragedies, what economically a disaster would follow if we won't see a major change over the next years. And if I have an, a minute left, of course. <laughs> just maybe, you know, no scenario analysis are nice, but what do we do with them? You know, we will refine them over the next years, um, uh, hopefully together with PIC again, um, but we, they are already used. And let me just give you one example. Um, the ECB just did this or published the results of a stress testing, of a banking mm -hmm. stress testing. So what does that mean? So that means that um, there, uh, we, we, we did some stress scenarios um, with um, significant financial institutions of, the, of Europe. 
And the results that were just published end of last week were, you know, not surprising, but I mean, it shows how pressing this topic is. It has shown that, you know, we are just talking about the big financial institutions, not the medium and small sized. No? Only 20% of those who were tested with the stress testing, right, um, around 100, to only 20% um, took climate risk into account when dealing with clients and talking about loans. Only 20%. 60% of those who were tested, stress tested, don't even have any kind of risk management when it comes to climate. And at the same time, two thirds of this significant banks, of the income of those significant banks, is dependent on carbon incentive clients. So that means, you know, there's a long way to go a really long way. And let me tell you, this is just, you know, a little folk, uh, th that's a little view on, on, um, on the significant uh, European banks. Just imagine if we would take to into account the small and medium sized banks, which may are the majority, or if you have not only a focus on Europe, but a global view that shows you maybe just a final word on that. So, you know, what we now realized is um, also at the Network for Greening the Financial System, maybe just a word on that. Um, the central bankers and the supervisors worldwide have, you know, acknowledged that there is a risk uh, we do not understand and that's new to us. And therefore we have founded an, a, a forum, a network. We are now 116 members uh, globally, central banks and supervisors. And what we do is stuff like the scenario analysis, uh, best practices for uh, supervisors, and so on. And maybe just um, to give uh, Katrin a little um, uh, hope <laughs> is <laughs> we uh, at the center, I'm the vice chair of this um, uh, network, and we just have decided uh, to open up a task force on bio loss of biodiversity because, you know, well, there was a long discussion because everybody is scared about the complexity of this and you know as it, it's climate is in this regard then simple you know have a co2 packs uh, tax and and others and then it would be possible but uh, with biodiversity is different so yeah just you may also a call for scientists um, it would be great uh, if we yeah could interact with scientists mm -hmm. on how to measure the economic impact um, of the loss mm -hmm. of biodiversity mm -hmm. thank you so much thanks Sabine. I think this uh, this fits very nicely what we have discussed so far and you mentioned the physical risk and the decisional risk and when we carried out the scenarios almost a year ago when we calculated the decisional risk we thought oh yeah the, the carbon prices might might be increased uh, from from 50 to 100 euros per ton mm -hmm. CO2 <laughs> and now we are basically in a situation where the gas prices are are, are, are tripling or, or even a factor of five so which is quite dramatic and also it's a social laboratory tragically enough uh, what we will see in the next few months with the food prices. Yes. So we are talking about the gas prices, but the food prices are, 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 are skyrocketing and, and this is really quite dramatic and has a huge potential to destabilize in particular uh, uh, many parts of, of Africa. So that, that's, that's a, a, a quite significant impact and, and, and what uh, Leonie has presented from my point of view is a little bit the uh, not, not it's the lower limit of the damages and not the upper limit and the impact on labor productivity and all sorts of things are quite important but when we evaluate all the shocks which we are now currently facing so we might have uh, to, to recalculate yeah. all the scenarios again. So with, with that, and, and by the way, it's also quite interesting that the central banks are the institutions who mm -hmm. want to, 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 to use that data. The financial ministries and even economic <laughs> ministries are less interested <laughs> even in the data, right? So it's a quite interesting situation. Okay, now with that, I would like to, to hand over to Simone. So 
Simone, that's we, we have discussed uh, uh, so that or we have basically uh, entered the bridge between uh, climate and, and economics and and uh, biodiversity and economics and and the central banks. But now, what about? the financial sector and the capital markets. Yes, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm an economist by training, but I have two parents that are biologists, so <laughs> you can uh, imagine we have some interesting discussions, and I was quite um, amazed by the picture that you had on uh, one of the pictures on biodiversity, it dip displayed a red kite. Mm -hmm. And I was very touched because this weekend I saw one and it was flying mm -hmm. over my head. <laughs> I thought it was a, um, an eagle, so, um, so much on my biology training. But um, no, generally speaking, I think what we see is, um, I have six slides, but I have three messages only, and I think the, I, I will just quickly go through them so you have them, and I try to correlate them while I go through my presentation. Um, first of all, MSCI is an ESG data uh, and rating provider. Um, we do work with a lot of um, clients in the asset management, banking, insurance space. And so what we observe is that, um, and that brings me to my first slide nevertheless, is that you can watch that while I speak, it's a bit um, dense. So we see that investors are driven by different objectives. We've heard that before. Um, and um, the question that we before heard as well is, does the emerging standards on sustainability disclosure, um, does it actually allow in different um, objectives to be reflected or do investors get what they need to implement these different objectives? And I think we were driven really by what our clients need in these different bu buckets. And you see that normally it's financial materiality that our clients need, but here we have with climate uh, more the impact side, and also we do have some impact solutions um, where we see an increasing need and interest. But I think what I'm getting at is that the standards that we're seeing emerge are now driving our clients. So there's also um, maybe some confusion in the market, but essentially there is a need to understand what actually the investor community needs to have in terms of data to comply with certain regulation, but also to maybe close data gaps. Um, and here what we're seeing is that even on the climate side, there are still significant data gaps. So if you take the most basic of all tons of CO2, scope one and two, which is essentially something that every company should disclose, in our database only about 40, less than 40% of all companies do actually report this data. And among the data that is reported, for instance, to an initiative where we also get the data from the CDP, a leading um, data um, collector, um, you can see that that data not necessarily always uh, reflects the sustainability reported data. So they, they have the sustainability reports and the CDP data, and that is not the same in 22% of the cases. And the third gap is then when you look at the supply chain. We've heard how important the supply chain is, um, and it's not necessarily easy to get that data, but <coughs> scope three data is increasingly relevant because it's just such a large footprint of many companies reporting. And here we have even the worst data situation, only less than 25% of companies report any category, so that's not all scope 3 emissions. So climate is not easy and biodiversity is probably more complex, but we also know that there are some metrics, and I will go into that in just a minute, that we could use to get the discussion started. However, however oftentimes what we perceive as a real gap here is that we don't know where the companies are located. We don't know where the operations are, and we don't know where the supply chain is actually located and which are the largest suppliers. And this is the really critical information to put together with the biodiversity information because you could see where the key biodiversity mm -hmm. areas are, you could see where deforestation takes place, where really we have issues um, that could be f significantly financially material. And so I go into these points just as we go along with the slides. Um, I can do this myself, right? So. Um, this is from a quarterly publication that we have, it's called the Net Zero uh, Tracker, and it assesses companies on the basis of how they, their emissions impact uh, the world's climate. Um, this is a, a metric we have developed last year, it's called implied temperature rise. I won't go into the details, but for every company we give it a sort of a degree, uh, we could say price tag. Um, and over 90% of the world's publicly listed companies are not on track with the Paris Agreement, which is to limit global warming well below two degrees. 
and the rate of reduction that would be required from these companies over 10% year on year until 2050. And that's um, even more than uh, what we currently have in, in an index where we um, track Paris aligned uh, companies, which is 7%. Seven so we see that there is a, an increasing um, gap between what is required to achieve this um, objective and what, we, what is actually in, in an investor's portfolio. So something's got to give. So these are some questions that um, we and other data providers ask um, investors on a net zero journey. It starts with something we call current exposure, which is more or less how do you stand, where do you stand today? And then it goes into this forward-looking mindset, which is where will you stand tomorrow? And it's exactly this forward-looking questions that sometimes you can say, huh, is it a guess, is it science, is it is it actually significant? We believe it is because there is no other way of measuring where a company will be standing in the future but to ask, so what are your targets? Are they actually aligned with a net zero pathway? Are they science-based? And so we, our products also capture that um, value chain, if you like, from a very static carbon footprinting to what will actually be um, the impact of your investment on global warming and what will be the impact of global warming on your investments. Um, now, if you look at where we stand in terms of regulation, and that's, that's sort of my day job because I have to track all of those. Um, ISSB is, is on it as well, Sue. So we're actually looking at how they, um, this, this ecosystem is emerging of climate-related disclosure, and we do the same on biodiversity, and we do the same on many other uh, components of ESNG. And it's very clear that um, everybody's looking into it, everybody's trying to replicate some form of the TCFD, but there are huge uh, differences. And we have published a blog earlier this year that shows that the major part of the differences comes from the fact that while everybody does require greenhouse gas reporting, the details look quite different. Um, and there is a lot of comply or explain, which leaves a lot of freedom, and there is a lot of qualitative versus quantitative information required. So just quickly touching on biodiversity. This chart is not from us, just to say. This is from the World Economic Forum and uh, PwC, I believe. Um, and it's really quite striking that concentration of dependency on, on natural cap capital or ecosystem services. But I've only brought you that chart. If you look at the same chart for the value chain, the picture becomes a lot more differentiated. And that, that's to say that actually each and every one of these sectors has an exposure to natural capital. I found it interesting to see one figure here that is that 70% of cancer drugs are inspired mm -hmm. or based on nature. Um, a lot of them, 20% based on rainforest uh, um, ecosystems. And so that's something that sh just shows you that you might have unexpected impacts from a loss of biodiversity. Um, in terms of metrics, just I think we may be touching on that in the discussion, but we, we look at mean species abundance, for instance, as an indicator that might be an equivalent, even though much more complex um, in use than um, a CO2 footprint. And we, we think that, for instance, when you look at how climate change started, the discussion with the investment industry started really with coal. I was working for a large insurer. We started divesting from coal. Um, and now we look at, and, and now the same company looks at uh, stopping insurance of coal. But I think here you could also say deforestation is a very simple indicator. And the, the faster the pace or the more the exposure to deforestation, the more of an impact you'll see on that particular industry. So we could start with that. I think you need to start somewhere. This is my message, I guess. Um, we look at biodiversity across all our products. I just wanted to show you one example, and that's the ESG ratings. So you have here the list of all uh, the drivers for biodiversity list to different percentages. And then we look at our key issues, which is essentially for each sector you have particularly material issues. And here you have a list of them. For instance, water stress, just to pick one, is the exposure of this company to a region that is exposed to water stress. And we were quite pleased to see this picked up by the SEC proposal on climate disclosure because they also ask a company to report how much of its operation is in a region that is exposed to water stress and how dependent it is on water as an input for its production. Raw material sourcing is, is another one, and it's essentially saying any sales that depend on seafood, timber production, beef, or cottons, and all of those are highly dependent on natural capital loss. Um, 
I will close with one uh, study that we just did and which showed that uh, less than a third of the food production which you have just seen is, is quite exposed to, to biodiversity um, loss is um, only, uh, uh, so less than one third of those companies have actually implemented programs that engage with agriculture suppliers to reduce the greenhouse gas emission, the use of fresh water or the chemical inputs like pesticides and fertilizers. So I think there's a lot of room for improvement and we would really welcome uh, the standard setters work in this area. We are looking closely at everything that's coming out in the space and we're commenting it, it also from our um, more the, the ESG rating, but also from the data perspective. Thank you. Yeah, Simone, thanks a lot. This is really very fascinating, and I would like to uh, to add just one component. Uh, you mentioned the coal issue, and uh, so now we are experiencing the gas prices are increasing much faster than the coal prices, and in particular in Asia. Uh, people now uh, investing again in coal, so we are basically see a continuation of the renaissance of coal. And uh, just to give you one number, uh, the coal-fired plants, which are uh, now under operation and installed, if they continue over the economic lifetime, they will produce a cumulative amount of emission which absorbs the full carbon budget, which is consistent with the 1.5 uh, limit, so to say. Just uh, this is not a solved problem, it's, a, it's a, a very huge problem. So in order to facilitate a little bit the debate, so um, what I, I would like to start in, in the following way. So uh, there is one white elephant in the room is missing. So we have nobody from neither from the EU Commission, from a regulator, we have no finance minister, so we have no policy makers here. And why is this the white elephant uh, in the room here? I would like to ask you, Simone. So what, what would, so you have shown basically what, what, what companies are doing, they announce uh, carbon neutrality goals. But my first question is, do you think that even under the current crisis, the energy crisis, uh, the increasing gas prices, they will stick to that. That's my first question. But then I would uh, open this to the panel. In the end, I would say if you have such a huge externality, uh, so then the regulator should do something. And my question is, what do you think when we would have a, a carbon price of, let's say, in the next year of $150 per ton CO2, would this then change also the companies and would this also have an impact uh, on the financial and the capital markets or the other way around when the regulator are doing nothing or not sufficiently enough so can then basically find the, the, the financial sector, the capital markets reasonable substitutes for that. It's an unfair question but nevertheless a question we should, we should ask. Yeah, I guess from, from our perspective what we, we observe is that um, our clients struggle to decarbonize their portfolios for a simple reason it's that they would incur in a, a very large, it's now a technical, technical term, tracking error, but it basically means that their portfolios are less diversified. And that comes with a risk, a concentration risk. And that brings me to the point <laughs> that when you do not have the policy that really changes the economy and the, the carbon intensity of the economy, it's very difficult for an investor to sort of run ahead of the curve. And you can do impact investment, but you cannot invest all the assets in this world into an impact investment frame set because there is not enough investment possibilities. Um, and so what we are doing, so MSCI is also a large index provider, about $300 billion um, track MSCI indexes. What is an index? It's a basket of, of shares, of company shares, so, so companies are in there. And um, there, there is a, a long discussion around what we could do to make those indexes more uh, greener, um, and it's it's really a f matter of then also being almost against regulation, which requires you to have a diversified portfolio, which requires you to make sure that your pension investments are safe and that they are there in 30 years when they are needed. So there is different regulatory signals and there are different regulatory constraints and we need to navigate that. Ten years ago I worked on carbon markets. I left then uh, Brussels and I was, uh, at that time the price was 8 euro a ton. Now it uh, was last year it was 100 euro a ton. So I think we're seeing a very volatile environment but one where the EU is still the only one with a meaningful carbon price signal. So we had hoped that it would be spanning the world. It's not the case so we need to find other solutions 
nations. And in the US, interestingly, if you look at what the, um, the White House program from last year on, on the financial sector brings out on climate, actually each and every um, administrator in the US will integrate climate into their policy framework. Um, and that will affect the financial sector most prominently, but it will not affect the industry. Mm -hmm. And so we have a situation where the financial sector is being asked to do certain things, but it might be against regulatory mandates or it might be against its client's interest. And that's a, that's a very problematic situation. Okay. So, but, but your main message is there, there are regulatory signals. There but are, but in both directions. <laughs> in, in both directions. So. <laughs> Sabine, so what would you expect? Uh, so I, it's, it's also, I, I know that the, the Bundesbank and the Central Bank cannot be mm -hmm. policy prescriptive. So mm -hmm. I, I th this I fully understand. But I'm sure that you can find a way to say, uh, or at least to, to, to what would be a much more appropriate environment to deal with uh, with uh, transitional risk and, and the physical risks. Uh, maybe, Otmar, I, I just do one step um, back because um, I think that the danger we are running in is we are, you know, a little bubble of, of, of scientists, economists and others uh, who understand very well what's going on and, and how dangerous the situation we are facing, right? But I would say that the majority of uh, people on our planet do not have those insights mm -hmm. and do have another level of income than us. And therefore, I think, you know, if you ask me, you know, what really makes, what could political decision makers or politicians, um, you know, lead to act ac accordingly, uh, then the, the, the clear answer is, first of all, you have to have the backing of the society and, sec and, and w how, how can you have the backing of the society if you ensure, you know, inflation is back. And mm -hmm. if you have low income or mid middle income and you're facing an inflation of 8% in some European countries double digit, um, then you have really concerns how to feed your family, right? And if then a politician comes and says, oh, we have to implement a CO2 price, you know, it's not, you know, you might be not so happy. So, but if you know, I think still we all know, although we see inflation at that level, we need to see a carbon price uh, or a mechanism, price mechanism that steer the behavior, right? Otherwise we, we mess up, right? So for me, it is extremely important that we also offer um, social solutions, right? That's for me the key aspect. And, um, you know, the, the social cost, as you said, that, that's one point, but the, on the other end is social compensation. I think this is what um, I really would um, um, yeah, ask for solution on that way. I mean, there are some solution in, in, uh, in place. But I think we really have, otherwise, you know, we can continue and, and, and um, get more data and becoming more sophisticated and, and increase the number of employees uh, dealing on that deal. But, you know, if you, and, and maybe just one example, I publish a, uh, in, in the Frankfurt um, uh, Allgemeine Zeitung a, an interview, and, you know, when you read um, the comments of people that are well informed, you just ask yourself, okay, obviously it is not understood as much as I thought. Right? <laughs> so <laughs> to, to say the least. Yeah. So and and then you but know and, and yeah. So maybe this <coughs> from my side not not solution, but I think if you whatever even I am thinking, am I always putting my energy in the right conferences or isn't it rather important to go there where you need to convince people, right? Will you convince? Thank you. Th thanks. Yeah, I, I would like to just to, to mention so that um, a few weeks ago we have published uh, a report where we basically made proposals, make, made proposals on, on the social compensation. And there's a very simple thing. Uh, policymakers in Germany and in Europe should find a way just to pay uh, 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 cash uh, to the people when the gas prices are increasing and even that is not possible in, in, in Germany. Austria made this possible but I think uh, in the next few months we have to be prepared because uh, the gas price issue has a potential to destroy the social cohesion in Germany and Europe. So that, that's, that's a big problem. I, I couldn't agree more. Now, I, I would like to, to ask uh, uh, Katrin uh, also, so 
if you could say a little bit, so you, you made a very nice proposals how to include uh, biodiversity issues in, in the reporting, but it would be good if we get a little bit of sense, so to say, what, what should be the benchmark, what kind of, mm -hmm. of policies is really needed to, to, to address the problem, because otherwise we, are, we, are, we, we need a benchmark in order to understand what financial markets, capital markets, and what policies can contribute to that. Um, well, there's several um, benchmarks out there with varying, uh, variant um, levels of ambition. It is similar like in the um, uh, CO2 debate, no net loss of biodiversity would be one strategy, nature positive another one. The third one would be to look um, on the decisions taken by the Convention on Biological Diversity in December and to take this as an ambition. Um, objective to um, follow biodiversity increases. What Was this what, what you yes. wanted to know? Yes, <laughs> as, a, as a first step. But <laughs> perhaps one thing that, I mean, the disruptions that we are seeing right now with the uh, um, um, invasion of the Ukraine with the uh, upheaval of the gas prices and all the social consequences, I mean, this is horrible. But this is only a disruption of the underlying changes we are seeing, the climate change, the biodiversity loss. So um, in spite of these short-term needs for action, we need to keep the long-term and even medium-term goal in, 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 in the back of our um, mind. But because it, even if these other problems are solved, um, the climate change and uh, the biodiversity loss will strike back. Uh, this, this brings me to, to another unfair question to Leonie. So uh, you, you basically, you, you elaborated on, on the social costs of carbon, and of course this is the, the lower bound. And, and also, uh, Katrin brought in the, the picture on, on biodiversity. So do you see any, any reasonable way how, how to integrate and to aggregate this information a little bit more because if you read the, the IPCC working group too, so there is a, a lot of information about the impacts also on the biodiversity, but it is so rich, uh, so disaggregated that in the end it is very hard to communicate this to, to decision makers. So uh, this, I, I know, so this is the, uh, the $5,000 question, but uh, you are so brilliant and I hope that you can at least <laughs> give us some guidance here. I mean, at least I have a couple of brilliant colleagues who have started some work on integrating <laughs> biodiversity um, loss into the social cost of carbon because currently such estimates, I mean, you, you have said this quite nicely, right? Um, ecosystem services are crucial for, for many economically relevant outcomes, but at the moment the social cost of carbon basically assumes that the impact of climate change on those ecosystem services is zero thereby massively underestimating the true cost, as, a, as you said correctly, right? This is just like a lower boundary of what I presented. So the key question is, given that this is so complex, how can we find a way to, to incorporate it in, in, a, in a credible way? And I think one thing you mentioned is that biodiversity is such a um, locally explicit ph phenomenon, right? We need like, like a global estimate for something that differs across regions massively and where we, have, where we don't have sufficient data in many places. So what people have, are currently starting to explore is how we can use satellite imagery, for, for example, um, remotely sensed products to kind of measure changes in, in biodiversity and in ecosystem services and the impact of climate change on them. There are also quite interesting approaches to kind of um, measure like how we value those ecosystems. Um, for instance, like um, um, navigation data that tells us like how many miles are people willing to travel to, to go to a nice national forest. Um, or social media data to see how do people um, speak about and, and, and again value um, those things. So of course those are just like first baby steps and um, much more work is needed. Also like really cooperation with you guys because I think you have the, like the, the natural science insights um, into the relevant processes but I think there, there is some way ongoing to improve this and it's really urgently needed. May I? Of course. One, one issue that I find interesting, we are having, we've tried in the community for many years, decades, to monitorize um, 
biodiversity and to put price tags on it. And it's working for some mm -hmm. components of biodiversity. For pollinators, we have fairly decent numbers, um, but also more on global and national scales than on uh, true uh, production systems. And um, what we observe is that um, many components of biodiversity cannot be monetized, and we don't can. We cannot put a price tag on it because also for, that's why I mentioned this, for some people such a forest is um, sacred and irreplaceable. And it, it matters basically, it, it's, it's the most important thing in their lives and it's defining their sense of uh, place and uh, their identity. If there's any way, I'm asking this to the community, to also allow these biodiversities that um, is so important to many people and also be, be probably to many people here in the room and remember red kites and so on, um, to, to capture this without the need to put this in actual costs. I, 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 can, I would like to respond to this <laughs> yeah, because from my point of view, uh, assigning a monetary value to biodiversity is a completely misleading concept. I say this as an economist. Why is this the case? Because, of course, you can do this in pollination and you can say, OK, uh, how much pollination can contribute to the GDP. But in the end, biodiversity is, is uh, to a large extent something which is a boundary condition for all the economic activities. It has a marginal value, it's, it's almost infinite. So, and, and therefore, to put the price tag, so there we know that many people have calculated and then they come up with astronomical numbers how valuable the biosphere is. I would say a much more, a much more modest way to do this is to think in the following way, and you mentioned this, if you look at the protected areas, mm -hmm. we, could ask, we could ask the question, what are the opportunity costs, to, for example, to enhance the protected areas, right? And, 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 and how, much, how much sacrifice we then, some economic activities, and then we could deal with, with, with that, with this opportunity cost approach. It seems to me it's, it's, it's much more valuable, but this is uh, something which, which needs more discussion. Yeah, Simone. So I think I come from this um, more from a, again from the financial market perspective. But what I, I, I really resonate with what Sabina had said before that it's so hard to explain to the men on the street and there are other priorities. I, I mean, experience this in my own environment. And I think the question of irreversibility is yeah. one so hard to pronounce word. I'm happy I managed. <laughs> but if we were to be able to say, OK, these are the parts of the system where if you go that way, you're not going to come back. And that means this. Yeah. I think that would make a difference. We had a, a very nice cooperation once with the WWF on the tipping points. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, w for me at least, this completely transformed my way of looking at these things because I understand the tap is full, the tap is full, okay, well, you know, there might still be a little bit of wiggle room, but when we say it's, it's actually, it's that or that, and there is no way back, I think that has a much larger feeling of disruption. And of course, the risk is always that you start being like the doomsayer and nobody hears you anymore because everything sounds so catastrophic. But understanding the consequences of that pathway, I think, can be can be explained and brought down to people as well yeah. and I to investors. I, I, I fully agree. And the conventional uh, marginal cost benefit analysis does not work if you are confronted with irreversibility and, 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 and tipping points. Yeah. So and investors understand tail risks. So yeah, yeah, that's exactly. The exactly. <laughs> and that, yeah. way that brings them yeah. together. Yeah. OK, but, but now for the last few minutes, so we are running out of time. I would like to allow for a few questions. Yeah, please go ahead and, and then Thomas. I actually, thank you. Tatiana Farina von SAFE, I would like to actually voice the questions of the online par participants. We have over 80 people online, and I would maybe, if you allow me, ask uh, three questions. And of course. For, yeah. um, so, from um, Nel Bon, so how are the scenarios that the Bundesbank worked on supporting the policy negotiations around uh, COP27 and COP15? Also, um, uh, so how, do, how did the scenarios that the Bundesbank worked on support the policy negotiations um, of the COP27 and 15, and also in the follow-up on the climate finance commitments of the private sector during um, COP26? There's also a question on the comparison of what the Fed is doing um, to what the Bundesbank is doing. So I guess these are um, 
uh, Director Sabina Malda. There's also a question to all panelists um, asking to come back to the sustainability reporting. What should the ISSB change regarding their standards from each panelist's point of view? Jan, I have a question from you. Do you want to ask yourself maybe later or should I ask your question? Okay. Okay, so then, then we answer this round of questions and then Thomas is on the list. So. Okay, I start. Uh, so um, the um, what kind of, as far as understood, is the question is, you know, does do the commitments that were, were made in Glasgow um, have an impact on the scenarios? And um, that's actually what we are uh, um, analyzing right now. And we'll publish an updated version of the scenario analysis, taking into account all the commitments, and most probably will publish that beginning of September. So I can. Um, ask for patient uh, beginning of September uh, the network for greening the financial system which uh, Bundesbank is part of will uh, publish that um, what does the FAT do? FAT has um, um, joined the network for greening the financial system in the uh, right after the last election um, that was a really great um, uh, movement and yeah so they are um, you know um, analytically wise um, with us and uh, they also and this is unknown unknown the fat together with the PBOC, so the People's Bank of China are leading a working group on climate of, uh, at the G20 uh, so um, this is for me important to show that on, on the central bank uh, area, you know, we sometimes overcome political issues and uh, that's a good sign. Thank you. So then there's a question to all the panelists, how to change, so Simone, I can like say something on the net zero financial sector first, because that's um, the, the alliances, the Glasgow financial alliances, we are part of that, as are other service providers, but also asset owners, banks, insurers, and they um, have very different um, targets and pathways, but probably the most ambitious one is the asset owner coalition, and they have set themselves very, very ambitious targets with a minus 30% reduction um, in a few years of their portfolios in CO2 intensity, and um, I think they will re have to review them because they go faster than the world economy. I don't think that they will be able to <laughs> match, meet that, but it's science-based, so it's, no. And we replicate the NGFS scenario, so I had to make a note, September, we need to go back into our models. Um, and on the ISSB, we're currently uh, putting together our response. I already said for us, location data is very important. It's replicated a little bit in the scenario analysis that you have proposed, but I think overall we just will very strongly welcome this, uh, especially also from the perspective of um, clarity and replicating TCFD. Um, what we're a bit maybe concerned of um, is the fact that as an investor you need to have very specific information and if there are lots of assumptions behind it, for instance in the financial impact measurement, it makes it very difficult to analyze. But we will provide more details. Well, um, for a biodiversity researcher it's, it's um, quite um, challenging to approach these, these um, um, pilots, but what I see as a challenge for me is to, um, this um, idea of how to capture the impact of a company on climate or biodiversity and to frame this as being only important if it's material to the financial investors. And I wonder how to give this more force because in the end, if we see it in a more global perspective, investors are part on um, this planet and you cannot make any profit on a dead planet to, to really har harness this to a degree that it really also changes um, uh, the planet to a, a better uh, pathway. Katrin, mm -hmm. may, may I just, uh, I know we are short of time, but that for me, because I have the chance to talk to re the representative of the ISSB, if I may have a wish uh, articulating, it is that it would be extremely helpful if we also have uh, to ask, if we could ask the, the, um, the real economies or the corporates that are reporting according to IFRS to have a transition plan in place, you know, a plan where they really show how they're going to, you know, continue that with their business model um, facing climate risk or loss of biodiversity because I think this will force so many corporates to really think about their strategy and gives, uh, you know, this is a win-win situation. So the corporate is forced to think of its business model and its impact and the, the, the investors then have, you know, a real plan um, whether they will make the transition smoothly. 
Thank you. Lili, would you like to? Yes. Yeah, I think, I mean, you, you have talked a lot about the impact of firms on climate change and biodiversity, but I think on the other way around, um, climate change is also having a huge impact on firms as then at the aggregate level measured in, in the social cost of carbon. So I think this is really an important point to stress also to enhance like um, the acceptance of climate policy measures to, to see it's like firms themselves that are affected and there we again have to take the whole supply chain into account. So even if it's not the local effects, then the ripple effects and the price signals can, can affect firms much more than they are currently aware of, I think. So I, I think we can allow for two more questions and then I ask you now to, to ask these questions and then I give the panel uh, 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 the opportunity for a final word and then we have to conclude. So Thomas was next on my list. Yeah, I'm afraid of some. <laughs> it's, it's more a comment actually, but maybe some people disagree. Um, and I just wanted to avoid that everybody gets depressed because biodiversity is so complex here. <laughs> Because for me, there are two very simple things about biodiversity, which maybe can be used more in the reporting. And number one is we know if we safeguard biodiversity, the social cost of carbon will be smaller. I mean, for example, a forest with many tree species is more likely to survive under climate change. So also the ecosystem services are more likely to be delivered, which also includes, by the way, climate regulation. I mean, a heat wave can, much, can, can become much hotter when the forest is gone. Um, the second thing is, that yes, it's really difficult to track down company activities to like one number of species loss, you know, with models like GlowBio, which have huge problems. But it's much easier, I think, to track down company activities to land use and land cover change. <coughs> In general terms, we know pretty well how different land, use, land cover changes influences, mm -hmm. influence biodiversity. It's more comp complex than forest, non-forest transitions. But in general terms, we know this and we monitor it from space. So if we focus more on these ecosystem level indicators of biodiversity change, instead of targeting the one number, maybe it's not so difficult to get this into account. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, it was a comment, not no, a no. question. No, it's, 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 it's wonderful. So, okay, yeah, the, the last question, and then we... Yeah, I, I know that maybe I'm opening a Pandora box, but what's about the small and medium enterprises? What are we, you know, how they can really, you know, uh, be part of, of, of the, deep, of, let's say, of the way on which they are providing this type of information, you know. Uh, clearly, they cannot provide all the, uh, let's say, all the information that are asked, I think, <coughs> from the reports, but clearly we know mostly in Europe that they are the majority of the firms. So are we thinking to something also for this medium, small and medium enterprises, how, you know, they can be part of this debate and also from this financial point of view, you know, they are not targeted by the, the larger investors. So clearly, maybe banks in this case can be the, the way through which we reach and provide some, some incentives to these type of firms. But clearly, they have to be also part of the debate. Okay, thanks. So these are two comments, but uh, two comments which are worthwhile to comment. And this is something which I would like to, uh, in, in, in that order to... As a closing remark, maybe as a, directly, as a, because then... As a closing yeah. remark. And so I think because it fits nicely. On the one side, we believe we need to work much more with, uh, with research uh, um, to identify these indicators. And we, we, we've looked into the globe bio and we, we know, but I think the fact is that we really need the location data to be able mm -hmm. to attribute specific um, acts, impacts, actions on a, on a company, back to the company. Um, and the second um, comment I thought was also very interesting on SMEs because what happens right now is that a lot of the listed companies have a lot of pressure. They have to report data. They get to talk with their investors. They see the board um, and that, that puts a lot of pressure on these companies. What do they do? say steel companies selling off their coal production, but then buying the coal from the very same company they just took out of their um, business mix. So that the p private companies need to be leveled up in terms of data and there is a cost concern, an impact concern, and that can be um, addressed, I think, by maybe having a simpler standard, a simpler way of going about reporting. And in particular, we will see now with the way the Europe is doing it, uh, whether it works or not. But the banks, in fact, have now to ask the companies, their counterparties, when they lend money to, even if they are not required to report this data by the EU, 
So the smaller companies, they have to report that to their banks and it be, will become a, an element of every know your customer check, of every onboarding process with the bank for a larger credit. And that not just in the EU, I think that we'll, we will be seeing this in the rest of the, of the world. The question is, will you get a better loan if you have a greener business proposition and we're not there yet? But I think starting with transparency is not a bad thing. Yeah. I would like to emphasize that I'm enjoying this panel very much and um, it's, um, I didn't envision it to, to work so well in bringing people with different perspectives together and what I find most amazing here is um, that there's a, um, basically a, a, the same goal and, and the same the level of ambition coming together from different parts, uh, mm -hmm. from finance, from um, central bank, uh, from science, and um, I think we are starting he here, or I mean, we are already on the way, but um, this is basically pushing the way forward. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you so much for, you know, being so open, and, and uh, I learned a lot today, and uh, as was said, I think this um, a, a cross um, a subject discussion is, is extremely important. Maybe just a final remark on, on your comment or question. Um, Europe is bank based, you know, although we would wish to have a deeper capital market, let's face it, um, the corporates are financed by the banks and therefore, and you know, our GDP, our wealth is based on the small and medium sized com uh, companies. Therefore, we cannot leave them out. So the banks play a major role to explain to their small and medium-sized customers what this whole debate is about. Because as you can imagine, the smaller a company is, the less capacities this company has to understand what you know, it is at stake. So therefore, you know, um, um, although we are not so in favor of the banking sector in Germany, um, this might also be a point where we really have to acknowledge they do have an important role in this regard and we should really ask them to play this role. Thank you. Leonie. Yeah, I also enjoyed the discussion a lot and I think um, it has become quite clear that we really urgently need to measure environmental risks and impacts, that this is needed by investors, by policymakers, by us as a society to really make informed decisions about our future. And the social cost of carbon is the first step or a metric to do so, but it has also become clear that it's quite challenging to come up with such a no number, in particular if you take biodiversity issues into account too. So a lot of work still has to be done, but to also conclude on a more positive note, I think we are on a good way. And I think the panel has shown quite nicely that the right people can come together to also use and communicate the scientific insights to the people who actually need that kind of information. Thank you very much. So this, this was a, a, a great panel. Thanks a lot. This was very much in, in, uh, enjoyable and very insightful. And please join me to give uh, the panel a big hand.